Oh, hi, everybody. Welcome to this very last day before solstice. Yay! Bring back the light. Uh, I'm Amy Gray, and I work in the education department, and I want to welcome artist Hannah Piper Burns to the museum tonight. Yeah. Um, as a multimedia artist, she's created projects from video, performance, installation, text, and interactivity. Her work has been shown widely across the U.S. and Canada at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the Indie Bits Festival in Columbia, South Carolina, the Winnipeg Underground Film Festival, and as part of Physical Education's Say When, also here at the Portland Art Museum, and just getting to spend 15 minutes with her tonight before this talk. I want to spend 15 days with her. She's really interesting. So I'm not going to tell you what she told me. She might get into it, but if she doesn't mention snails, bring it up at the wine and cheese part after, because it's pretty interesting. So, Hannah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. I don't know if I'm going to talk about snails or not, so if you... Um, want to talk about snails, it's, an op it's a standing open invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Not for eating, for treating. Uh, just as a side note, I'm really happy to be here, so thank you to Amy and John and Julian and everybody for helping make this happen in the museum. Um, it's been really thrilling to be able to do so much public programming um, with the museum over the past year and this um, particular event has some sentimental value to me because from 2010 to 13 I worked for the Portland Art Dealers Association and as part of that I was sending out their monthly pot -a picks newsletter which some of you might receive and um, so I was always writing about these artist talks uh, in that newsletter and, and being like, oh, this is so cool. This event is so cool. And so um, years later to be able to be part of it uh, is really special to me. So I'm really um, grateful that um, it, could, it could happen. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about Black Box by John McCracken. It's from 1965. And for those of you who know me or are familiar with my practice, it may seem a little bit odd for somebody who works in found footage, multimedia, text, and interactivity and performance to pick a work of West Coast space and light slash minimalist sculpture. Uh, and that's kind of actually why I think I was so drawn to it, was sort of the perversity of choosing something that wasn't immediately, obviously, related to my practice. And in fact, I feel like I passed this work like on my way to si see if I could find the Jenny Holzers, you know, something that would like really uh, uh, make a lot of sense. And um, walking by it, it was sort of one of those like er, moments and I, you know, kind of turned back around to encounter it and, you know, did a little walk around and took a photo of the, of the plaque and, and kind of followed it away. And then later on in that same visit, I was upstairs uh, looking at the Sun Ra exhibit um, that's a part of We Construct Marvels Between Monuments. If you haven't been up there, uh, I think it runs through January 30th. Uh, it's a must-see exhibition of Sun Ra ephemera and music and art. And there's a still up there from Space is the Place that shows a figure with a mirror for a face and there was some sort of poetic kind of rhyme to me between that mirror and this surface that kind of re-hit my intuition and kind of confirmed for me that this was what I wanted to talk about. So, um, yeah, at the outset, myself and John McCracken don't seem to have a lot in common. You know, he works by hand. Uh, I work in ready-mades and found media. Uh, he's interested in painting and sculpture. I'm interested in time-based makings of meaning. But we actually have a lot more in common than you might think. Uh, well, we both have MFAs from the Bay Area. That's like a pretty easy one. Um, my school played his school in basketball. We both believe in a certain kind of like reductive quality in our making. I often start with vast repositories 
uh, four seasons of a show or you know, six hours worth of skincare commercials. And from there, I'm reducing and reducing and reducing into some kind of meaning. And he talked about it in an interview as a boiling down, which I really love. It's, it's so much less of a, this idea of excising or taking away and more of this idea of a, an alchemical process or a transformative process where you're changing the state of something instead of simply making it less. And um, for a long time, I really distanced myself and, and how I thought about my practice from any kind of references to formalism. I kind of define myself against formalism, especially as a filmmaker. Um, something I've learned over the last year especially is that we're not who we think we are. Rarely are we who we think we are. And I had a little bit of an assisted epiphany recently about the ways in which my work really does uh, connect to formalism in terms of where I choose to put uh, blackness, where I choose to put image, where I choose to cut, where I choose to edit. And so I came to appreciate that, that he and I are both sort of interested in formalism but coming at it from different ways. And of course, this is a piece made from fiberglass and resin. And at this time, it was still a bit of a new thing to use industrial materials and processes in the making of fine art objects. And in a way, that's what I'm doing with media. I'm taking industrial materials, materials that are from the industries of commercials, the industries of reality television, and using them in a fine art context. In some ways, fiberglass and resin are to like marble as reality TV is to fine art documentary. Uh, and we're both invested in this sort of simultaneity, this both and. You know, in other parts of his practice, he was interested in things that were both painting and sculpture, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. He's interested in something that both absorbs and reflects. He's interested in presence and absence, and um, the holding of that contradiction, and you know, the hand as well versus um, the machine. And for both of us, there's a play between banality and what I hope is a profundity. And that's probably the reason, and I found this also really interesting in um, researching him a little bit, is that he's one of those artists that has been, it's been said, you know, is this really art, it actually? And that's actually something that's also, it's a question I've gotten in my practice. And, um, I really like that idea of searching for something almost metaphysical in something that feels very quotidian and almost banal and simple and more femical, like this cube. So I'm gonna talk about John McCracken as an artist and his practice broadly. I'm also gonna talk about this, this black box in particular. And um, I'm also not I should mention the first artist in this Artist Talk series who's chosen this piece. In 2011, the artist Nan Curtis spoke about this work. And in 2009, the artist Pat Boaz also spoke about this work, as well as a painting by Philip Guston that some of you might be familiar with if you spent a lot of time in the collection. And um, I took a, uh, I watched both of their Artist Talks online in preparation for this, and uh, a couple of things they said resonated with me, and I'll mention those sort of as I go as well. And another thing I'm going to do is sort of mix together the two meanings that I think are inherent in every great artwork. There's a persistent meaning, and that uh, is often has to do with the situation in time and the artist's intent. And then there's the evolving meaning that has to do with the conditions uh, of, and the weight of history, you know, not, not just the conditions of its making, but this, the meaning that we bring to it after 30 years, after 40 years, after 50 years. So I'm gonna kind of weave those together as I go. The first thing that I thought about, the first thing that struck me when I saw this piece was thinking about the clawed glass. And the clawed glass led me into a larger kind of meditation on these ideas of mediation and surveillance that I think are prevalent in both John McCracken's work and my own, albeit in different ways. The Claude Glass 
gained popularity in the late 18th, early 19th century. It was a piece of technology that was used both to paint the landscape, but also just to encounter it. And it was something that you would carry with you and uh, use to observe the landscape. And it was named the Claude Glass after the painter Claude Lorraine, who was a picturesque painter. And he didn't use the glass, but the paintings that he made looked like what the landscape looked like in this glass. It was very soft. It was sort of set off against the background. And Claude Glass came, uh, came into popularity through the work of poet Thomas Gray, who uh, in 1775 wrote this book about his travels with the Claude Glass. And he included this very specific direction for how to use the Claude Glass, which is that you want to make sure that the object is behind you, and then you want to hold it off to an angle, and it just occurred to me that this is the first selfie pose instructions ever recorded. And actually, in his um, writings, he talks about being so absorbed in walking through the landscape, observing it mediated through this clod glass that he tripped and fell into a ditch and banged himself up, and it's like the origins of the first millennial joke of all time. Of course, the Claude Glass has another name, a name that has kind of taken on a life of its own over the past couple years with uh, the show Black Mirror. So of course the other name for a Claude Glass is the Black Mirror. So in a prescient way, I think McCracken was sort of anticipating the screen and the charge of the screen. And so when I look at this, I see my laptop before it's been turned on. I see my phone before I've woken it up. And it seems like it's asleep, but it's charged with that potential of lighting up. But even though it's asleep, uh, like many of the objects we're now learning, it's never off. So Black Box was made in 1965 uh, when John McCracken was 31. Uh, and I'm 34, so that's cool. Good job. Um, and it was a year before he really sort of came into his own in the so-called minimalist movement with the form he would become famous for, which is the plank, which you can see behind me. This is another piece by John McCracken. So shortly after he made this box, he began working in these plank forms, which he saw as sort of this, this bridge, both physically and metaphysically, between worlds. It was a bridge between the wall and the ground, painting and sculpture. And um, what I learned is that he often named these planes, these plates, these planks, using language from magazine fashion ads. And in fact, this one behind me is called Glow. And when I found that out, it just, uh, again, it's one of those um, you know, intuitive resonance because something that I do in my work with skincare commercials is really operate with that vernacular of advertising and what I call like the big sister voice of advertising and how it speaks to us. And um, I have a piece that just has the word radiance like over and over again as I've excised it from all these different commercials and all these different fonts coming up over and over again. So I saw that glow and I just thought, yeah, we're on the same vibration. And so for that reason, I decided, you know, black box is a pretty, uh, literal title. It's a pretty straightforward title, but I wanted to take it at the same value that I took these planks and think about how he's using vernacular, maybe how he could be operating on different levels with that meaning. And the term black box first sort of came into the American vernacular around 1945. It was a term used for electronics, which I'll touch on a little bit later. When we think of black box, or at least when I think of black box, what I think of is flight recorder. We think about that all the time with, with um, major transportation accidents. They're always trying to find the black box, which is a, it's not in fact black, but in our minds, I think we think of this perfect, indestructible black box amidst this smoldering wreckage, and it holds the key, right? It is the key to understanding what has happened because it has recorded and surveilled that incident. Um, it's a vehicle towards understanding. And when thinking about Claude Glass, Black Mirror, Scanner Darkly, 
Philip K. Dick. I couldn't help, of course, but think about 1 Corinthians 13, which I'm just going to read. It's a really, I, I don't um, have a lot of familiarity with the Bible, so um, this passage really struck me. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know as even I am known. And in her talk, Nan Curtis uh, talked about how she feels like this box gazes back, that it, uh, and even Pat Boaz in her talk kind of referred to it as this intelligent object. And I think uh, none of us could really, um, in 2009 or 2011, and John McCracken passed away in 2011, I don't think any of us could have predicted how many intelligent or smart objects we would be living with and bringing into our homes to silently observe us with their sleeping screens. Now we've let all these interfaces into our homes. And I think about black cube, black box, black cube. And black cube is a creative intelligence agency. Now, the reason I know about Black Cube is twofold. Black Cube was involved with Cambridge Analytica, which, as we now know, was a data mining operation largely responsible for swaying both Brexit and the US election. And we now know that Harvey Weinstein, the producer, employed Black Cube as a means of gathering creative intelligence on many actresses, including Rose McGowan. And um, I love that phrasing that doublespeak creative intelligence uh, so much, and I love that idea of thinking about an intelligent object that also has a creative intelligence. So John McCracken definitely would have loved the idea of his work as an interface. I don't know if he would have used that word, but if you're not familiar with him as an artist, he was very, very vocal about his metaphysical and his spiritual beliefs. He believed in ghosts, he believed in aliens, he believed in multidimensional beings and multidimensional experiences of time. He believed that when he was 17, he time traveled. He recalls this anecdote of being 17 and having this feeling of being watched. And then 15 years later, looking out uh, a window and realizing that he was being watched by him in the future. And that it, it's uh, time travel as sort of this cosmic surveillance. And that idea really uh, jived with me because I think about time and surveillance a lot. Reality TV is a function of time and surveillance. And especially in reality TV, and especially the show that I work with the most, The Bachelor, time is stretched and compressed in really interesting ways, where like three days in Bachelor Nation is, or a week in Bachelor Nation is three days of Earth time, you know? Or we're experiencing the show as if it's happening in real time, but the contestants have experienced it four months earlier, and now they, like John McCracken, have time traveled back and are observing their past selves on the screen. So he was always really upfront about seeing his works as keys to communication. He saw them as kind of portals. He liked to talk about them as maybe being artifacts that were left by multidimensional beings or ways to sort of get into a state that would allow you to think multidimensionally. And I think that's what I uh, think is the most fascinating about McCracken as an artist is that he managed to marry this concept of silent presence, which is so inherent to the tradition of minimalist art, if we think about um, Tony Smith, Carl Andre, Donald Judd, kind of the classic minimalists, uh, Robert Morris, and this idea of, of, yeah, silent presence in an encounter with an object with this idea of creative intelligence that has turned out to really be shaping, that idea of creative intelligence really be shaping our world in ways that none of us could predict. And 
Speaking of like monoliths and creative intelligence, um, just as an anecdote, I recently traveled to Scotland and was able to see a lot of the ancient monoliths that are there, specifically the Callanish Stone Complex, which is on the Isle of Lewis, and it's a Neolithic stone circle that has a very specific presence, but I would say an extremely different presence than this object. Like the idea of presence, the idea of communication is so starkly different with these stones pulled up off the earth and put up in a symbol than this painstakingly, meditatively created man-made piece. And all of this interest that McCracken had in communicating with something higher, this idea of portals and cosmology, all of this was the reason that many, many people, when 2001 A Space Odyssey was released, thought that John McCracken had in fact been the artist who created the monolith that appears in that movie. He did not create it, but it's probably one of those things <laughs> where uh, the production designer was an art, ex-art student who had probably studied McCracken's work or something along those lines. Um, I think a lot of LA artists found their work going into Hollywood movies. And just as an aside, I also, when I see this piece, think a lot about Blade Runner. I think a lot about those wet black stone steps that Ridley Scott was so intense about getting the perfect level of shine every time, this idea of, again, this ultimate reflectivity that is, seems so part of like a sci-fi reality. And I'm more of a man who fell to earth kind of person than like a 2001 kind of person, but from what I understand, in the movie and uh, in the original story, um, which is by uh, and, yeah, thank you. Um, in Clark's original story, the monolith is both a catalyst and a transmitter. So it both, it's, both a, it's both an object of surveillance and it's both an object that catalyzes. And I thought it was really interesting that in that original Clark story, the story is called the sentinel, and the idea of the monolith as a sentinel, the watcher. I've also had works that I consider sentinels or that have their own sentinels in them. When I did my show upstairs, I had a piece that as part of the installation incorporated a motion sensor air freshener. And I thought of that in my mind as an object of domestic surveillance. It's a sentinel, it is watching you and you may not even know it. It, it, it registers your movement through scent and often you don't know it's there until you smell the air freshener or you hear it kind of off-gassing. Um, so I really liked that idea of this, uh, the idea of the, of the sentinel. And um, a lot of my work also uh, echoes surveillance vernacular. So this piece that, that had the air freshener was a 22 channel video that was made to look like a surveillance bank. And I think about, again, a scanner darkly and this idea of always watching, watching. I also think about portals a lot in my work. Um, I see Bachelor Nation as a dimension that sort of exists alongside of ours, the world of this show. And there are different like ways of traveling back and forth in different portals. And in another video that I made up there in the Apex, I was using, there's a, uh, like a picture in picture function uh, on the show where they're showing a clip and then in the corner they have a little video showing the contestant watching, them, watching the clip and we're watching the contestant's face as they're watching the clip in real time and I enlarged that image uh, seeing it as sort of like a portal. I also created a portal as a wall sculpture based on the idea of the Bachelor Mansion, which remarkably did not burn down recently. It, like, the fire went all the way up to the bushes and apparently has left the main structure of the mansion intact. It's down in Cal outside of Calabasas. Um, but 
the mansion is actually, um, so it's the place where the sh all the Bachelor and Bachelorette seasons are filmed. And when it's not used for filming, people actually live there. It's, it's a family that lives there and owns the house and they rent it out. And so when production comes in, I read this anecdote, anecdote they put down two coats of paint to, all over the house and then they film and then everybody packs up the stuff and they put on another two coats of paint and they leave. And I started thinking about that and doing a little bit of math in my head because there have been 23 seasons of The Bachelor and like 15 seasons of The Bachelorette and if that's four coats of paint, that's 150 coats of paint on the inside of this house. And I started thinking about all the stuff, like amber, like what and thinking about those layers of paint as a way of thinking about time and the show and, and what they could trap between them in terms of emotional energy. And so I had this uh, wall piece that was like a peeling back of, of the wall and underneath of it was a lenticular print, so a, one of those kind of holograms that moves when you move. Sometimes you can get one that's like a cat waving or... Um, but this image was actually of a transition that you find within the show where they like cut between scenes by blowing it out into this kind of burst of white. And I saw that as this like betweenness. That's like the key. That's like the portal. So I opened up the like opened up the paint of the Bachelor Mansion to sort of expose this pure energy as the portal that you could kind of tr pass through to get to Bachelor Nation, to understand Bachelor Nation. And the last kind of thing I want to talk about in terms of my personal, like emotional connection to this piece is another definition of black box. And this is kind of both a technical definition but also a conceptual definition. A black box in electronics is a device that has inputs and it has outputs. But what's between those inputs and outputs is either irrelevant or impossible to know. So in her notes, uh, Nan Curtis talked about being here and, and seeing a child walk by this piece and say, like, what's inside of it? And thinking, oh, that's such a cool, like, such a cool question to ask. Like, what, what's in there? And... Um, I love that idea of surveillance also as this push and pull between the knowable and the unknowable. Like, we can surveil somebody 24 seven, but there's only so much we can really know from that, right? We can read the Wikipedia article about a movie and read the Wikipedia plot. That's not the same thing as seeing the movie, you know? It's this idea of, of lack or this idea of constant push and surveillance, this tension between the knowable and the unknowable that I find really profoundly in this piece. And it reminds me of how black box is used, taken from that electronics context, and used in fiction as sort of a deus ex machina, you know, and, and we found this device and we don't know how it works, but maybe we can reverse engineer it. The idea that sometimes the more we try to know something, the more unknowable it is. And I've often heard trauma referred to as a black box. And this past year, I was in a certain place at a certain time and had a traumatic event occur, an injury that was both physical and emotional. And in those times, in that time, what I wanted most was a recording. I wanted omnipotent surveillance. I wanted my own intelligent object that could tell me what had happened and why, that could explain, right? And I can't have that. It doesn't exist. It's unknowable. It's the black box. And the fact that a piece made 60 years ago, a piece that could predict screen culture, a piece that could predict selfie culture, a piece that could predict 
the Google Home that could predict Alexa and our, and our Samsung TVs that listen to us, a piece that can be used to talk about the human urge to touch that which is outside of us, to see two worlds at the same time, and of course, a piece that can speak in a really impersonal, uniform, and formal way to a really deep and profound paradox and a deep question that has no answer. That's why I love this piece, and that's why this is so powerful to me, and I think it's beyond the relationship that it has to my work, which it has been a pleasure to discover, and it's been a pleasure to find all of those connections between experimental video art about The Bachelor and this black cube. Really, art is about the individual experience, right? It's about what relationship we have to the work. So more than anything, it's been a pleasure to be able to just talk about that and I think all of us have that, whether it's something here in this museum or something we grew up with. So thank you very much for being here, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or we can just have cheese. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, but I, I do think it's interesting. One thing that I really noticed is how the pedestal creates a band of white around the bottom of the cube in reflection, and then that band is kind of echoed in the laser cut around the pedestal. And I uh, haven't paid enough attention to the PAM pedestals to know if this is a normal beveling situation. But I think it is a really elegant kind of formal rhyme that's going down. And I also appreciate that they've put it at a human scale, that it's something that, at least for me as someone who's 5'4", you know, it's something that I can encounter on a human level. And I think that was something that was really important to minimalists, was to have a physical experience with art, right? That it's something you could feel with your body or experience with your body. And that's something I think any installation artist is also really concerned with. Yeah. You talk about the ambiguity of taking sculpture. I'm sitting here and I look at this and just imagine that popping into, into sculpture, there it is. Huh. Uh, unexpectedly, oh. once, once a human, once a life, they're equal here. Yeah, it's a really beautiful moment. I'm not sure who it curates the... Sarah Kuchewski? Yeah, it's a really, really beautiful moment. And then you kind of have the kind of going into the corner with the Flavin. And I know um, McCracken was really influenced by Barnett Newman in particular. Barnett Newman? Yes? This is more of a sort of what it reminds me of rather than when I first moved here almost 39 years ago, one of the first places that I worked in was the Black Box, downtown on uh, Second and Market Street. I guess it was Second. But uh, it was weird working in such a place after having lived in more organic places so much of my life before. And uh, I was working for a place called Odia, which was one of my uh, housemates. Which I didn't last too long, you know, because they had, I had a contract with the uh, paying them to help me get a job. Um, um, I switched 
do when you come to a new city, I guess. And girl haven't been elsewhere. And so um, I always thought of working in the black box. Is that what this makes you think about? Yeah. My, my father worked there too. He calls it the black market. Black market. <laughs> Thank you all so much.